Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who are joining in from Hanoi, Zoom, and Facebook Live. Thank you for tuning in to the final symposium session of the 25th Sipawa Conference titled Collaboration and Cooperation in Archives. I'm your moderator, Joshua Ng, a digital preservation analyst at Archives New Zealand. And this session follows nicely from the pre previous session where collaboration was featured as one of the ways we adapt to the new normal. Um, this, the three presentations that we have in these sessions are more examples of collaborations within and beyond archives. Each presentation is 20 minutes, and then we will have a question and answer session at the end with all of the presenters. And if you are using Zoom, please submit your questions via the um, Q&A button below. For our friends on Facebook Live, we will be collating the questions from the comments. Um, same for the people in Hanoi. Uh, someone will be collecting your questions and we will answer them live. Without further ado, let me introduce our first presenter, Matthew, Matthew Yang. Matthew Yang is an archive officer at the Asian Film Archive. He manages film restoration and digital, digitization projects, processes born digital moving image content and contributes to the planning and maintenance to the planning, maintenance of the digital preservation system. Prior to this, he worked as a data wrangler for film and television. And the title of his presentation is Now or Never Pushing for Film Preservation Through Interagency Relations. The screen is yours, Matthew. Hey, thank you, Joshua. Hello, uh, greetings to colleagues and attendees around the world. Uh, my name is Matthew and I represent the Asian Film Archive in Singapore. Uh, today, I'll be speaking about how film preservation efforts can be supported through interagency inter relations uh, using a Memorandum of Understanding or MOU signed between the Asian Film Archive and two other Singaporean agencies as a case study. The focus of the presentation will be on the MOU's development uh, outcome, as well as the key observations and lessons learned. And this will be the outline of my presentation today. I will first lay background information of the parties involved in the MOU, followed by the details of the MOU and its development and outcome. Next, I will share lessons and observations and the impact of uh, COVID-19. And lastly, I will conclude the presentation with next steps to be taken. And uh, this is the organizational structure of the three parties involved in the MOU that I'll be discussing today. The first is the National Library Board of Singapore, and it is the statutory board responsible for the public libraries in Singapore. And the second is the Asian Film Archive, which is currently a subsidiary of the National Library Board. And lastly, uh, the Singapore Film Commission, an agency under the Infocom Media Development Authority of Singapore. And as you can see from the diagram that all agencies in discussion today are under the Ministry of uh, Communications and Information seen right here at the top. And so the MOU was um, initiated by the Asian Film Archive in 2007, and it was signed between the Asian Film Archive, the National Library Board, and the Singapore Film Commission. And the idea was to share resources and draw on each other's expertise to better preserve and promote Singaporean films. And it is worth noting that uh, the Asian Film Archive was only uh, two years old at the time the MOU was signed. And so this was a strategic initiative by the Asian Film Archive. And so the strategy was to bring together resources across um, the agencies to further our mission in two ways. The first, uh, to, to develop the Singapore Film Collection in a systematic manner. And the second, to provide the space for the reference collection as the Asian Film Archive was not part of the National Library Board back in 2007. And so how does it work? Uh, and essentially films that receive uh, public funding will be transferred from the Singapore Film Commission 
to the Asian Film Archive after its completion for preservation and archiving. And uh, access copies will then be made and these copies will be transferred to the National Library for access in their uh, reference library. And this arrangement is, um, as you can see, is a mutually beneficial arrangement where it ensures that publicly funded films are preserved. And for the Asian Film Archive, uh, this provides us an automated system of sorts to acquire these films, uh, reducing uh, the need for manual processes in terms of acquisition. And lastly, the films achieve a greater level of access by tapping on the National Library's audience through its reference collection and its online catalog. And so the MOU has brought uh, plenty of improvements over the years. However, I must stress that it took a very long time and a lot of hard work to realize the objectives and credit to the team, both past and present. Uh, and we have started seeing the results of the MOU within the past five years or so, even though it was signed in uh, 2007. And so the first key development is in acquisition. The acquisition process previously was uh, very manual since Singapore doesn't have a legal deposit for film, film works and the preservation of publicly funded films wasn't written into the funding agreement initially and after several reviews and feedback to the commission, we have now created this as part of the grant agreement. Uh, therefore, filmmakers are now required to provide a proof of deposit to the Film Commission before the release of the final payment milestone as part of their grant. And therefore, this has streamlined our acquisition process with uh, the Commission's authority and help uh, making the process more automated of sorts. And the second key development is the consistency of formats. There wasn't any sort of consistency in the formats uh, that we receive uh, for preservation for many years. And it took many reviews to set in place standards. And filmmakers now know what is expected since our preservation guidelines and specifications are uh, clearly defined in, defined in the funding agreement, uh, which I will share more in the following slide. And I think one of the most uh, important developments of the MOU is stakeholders better understand the need to preserve their films early and what uh, preservation entails and how it requires everyone's effort for the work to be successful. And for example, there's been a huge improvement in the awareness on format delivery by the filmmakers as well as uh, file naming conventions and the general overall organization of their files. And I think these small details are very encouraging signs. And so I would like to highlight um, one aspect that saw a lot of development and that is in the preservation specification sheet, which I mentioned earlier. And these specifications are part of the funding agreement specifying the preservation deliverables to be submitted to the archive after its completion. And as you can see, it's quite a generic list. And these materials, I mean, the materials that we require from um, the filmmakers are actually kept to quite a minimum. And, and as you can also see, the technical specifications are heavily uh, simplified if I may say. And this is the result of uh, numerous reviews and uh, refinements as we have gotten feedback that our previous requirements were a little bit too robust for, for many, uh, which has caused sort of a, a strain on budgets in producing these uh, deliverables. And so we have arrived at this current uh, specifications uh, with the commission, which we feel is almost uh, the minimum, but also like the most distilled version it can be. And I'd like to show you a previous version. So this is an earlier version of the sheet, which is a bit more detailed and specific. And as you can see, there are several different specifications uh, for different cameras and, and it includes materials such as a DCDM and related materials such as a production photographs, storyboard and trailers. And I think um, it wouldn't be an issue for, I think, many of us uh, archivists, but 
I think for the filmmakers, it, it is additional costs and work for the filmmakers. And um, because of this, um, we have made numerous adjustments uh, based on the feedback, but also bearing in mind that um, we still have to fulfill our preservation objectives. Okay, so, you know, uh, fast forward 14 years later, and here we are today. I think I'll say the MOU has uh, helped the archive achieve its desired outcomes. I think for one, it continues to play an important role in our work as it is like the closest thing we have to a legal deposit for film. And it ensures the preservation of films that are supported using public funds. And as I've said earlier, this arrangement has you know, greatly helped us in creating a system for the films to be preserved. And um, this has, I'll say, allowed us to channel more time and resources on other efforts. And most importantly, I think the MOU has gotten stronger over the years as I think stakeholders are you know, finally seeing, I think they see the results today. And, and I think this is built upon you know, many years of um, trust uh, through our work and uh, expertise. And another successful outcome is the AFA collection at the Reference Library, which has um, expanded into two physical locations where the public can access um, our films. And currently we have over 450 titles available for viewing at um, both libraries and they are searchable through the library's online catalog and um, the public can easily book a slot, you know, go down to the library and enjoy the films. But at the same time, you know, um, we're all aware of um, the pandemic and, and this pandemic has brought many new challenges and as well as uh, opportunities and, and also new perspectives to our work. And in terms of the impact, I would say the first is um, we're ex currently experiencing some delays in uh, the submission of the films that have gotten funding. I think this is natural because of the disruptions and many of the films are slowly picking up um, production and, and I think um, it's nat naturally expected that we will have a backlog of films that, that will eventually come into uh, the archive. And second, um, we have seen new funds being rolled out to support um, the industry. And so the government and the supporting agencies are channeling more funds to support the film and TV industry during this uh, difficult period. And this has led to new grants to support uh, local talent, which I'll be speaking more about in the following slides. And the third is um, a less food traffic at the reference library. And I think this is also natural since the, the libraries are operating at a 50% capacity. So um, there is um, less patrons and uh, I think naturally um, less engagement with the reference collection. Uh, last but not least, I think ironically, uh, there's also been a significant increase in the loan and viewing requests uh, from our stakeholders and uh, many of which are actually for you know, uh, online VOD, OTT services. And I think this search in requests uh, speaks volumes of uh, the value of our work. And so one of the funds that um, I sp I'm really speaking about is the Public uh, Service Content Fund, which was uh, introduced sometime last year to create uh, more production opportunities for media professionals. And uh, 8 million Singapore dollars uh, was allocated for the creation of short film content. And um, each project will receive up to $35,000 uh, in uh, Singapore dollars. And uh, I think the point I would like to make is um, these films that receive these, uh, the grant uh, currently do not fall uh, in this uh, MOU, the agreement. And I think a further discussion is required to, to discuss the outcome and the preservation intent uh, for these projects. And uh, another grant i um, also like to share is the Southeast Asia Co-Production Grant. Uh, and uh, while it is, not, it is not directly the direct outcome of um, the COVID pandemic, uh, this grant is the result of newer strategies to support the industry, in this case, uh, regional co-production. This grant is for feature film projects and each project will receive up to 250,000 Singapore dollars for production. But the condition is that each project must be directed by a Southeast Asian, non-Singaporean, 
and has to be produced by either a Singaporean or Southeast Asian producer. And I think similarly, this grant does not currently fall under the agreement as well. And it also raise, raises other questions on who is responsible for the preservation of the work. Uh, should it be the Asian Film Archive or uh, the National Archive of the respective director? So I think uh, there are many new questions that we have to answer. And so while the MOU has brought obviously many huge improvements to our work, I'll say it's far from perfect and uh, I'll be touching on some of the key observations and takeaways. And the first is the MOU does not cover the full scope of production in Singapore. And I think what this means is that we have to continue to reach out to other filmmakers to preserve their works in order for the collection to be representative. And I think uh, it can be quite a challenge as the main mode of filmmaking in Singapore are still independent productions. And more often than not, um, these filmmakers and their works have uh, little online presence or documentation. So uh, it requires more uh, research and effort to acquire these films. And second, the MOU is clearly not an equivalent to a legal deposit. And essentially, there is no guarantee or obligation from agencies to uh, fulfill this MOU. And the MOU obviously can also be subjected to changes anytime, such as uh, leadership or management changes. Therefore, there is um, definitely no promise. And next. Um, so, I mean, I've, like I've said, it took um, the Asian Film Archive more than 10 years for the MOU to realize its um, aspirations. And I think uh, one has to be realistic and about um, hitting those targets and to also communicate and propose changes in advance time. And uh, I think the point is, you no know, things will not just change overnight, uh, which leads me to my next point. You know, the MOU is clearly not a silver bullet and um, we will have to continue our work in terms of advocacy and respond to uh, new developments, you know, such as this pandemic. And so um, my last point is uh, working and coordinating with multiple agencies uh, can be quite a challenge. And more often than not, uh, one might not be able to arrive uh, at an ideal outcome and, and compromises will sometimes have to be made. And, you know, using my you know, the, specific, uh, the specification sheet, which I shared earlier as an example, you know, I think uh, ultimately is, you know, is perhaps it's better to just archive something than uh, nothing at all. So um, my, my last slide, which is uh, the next steps for us. And I think admittedly things, you know, do fall through the cracks and, you know, with competing responsibilities and, you know, unexpected circumstances, uh, you know, but I think the next step for us is to obviously conduct a review of the existing agreement with the relevant agencies to, to discuss on the new and future schemes of funding that currently do not fall under the MOU. And knowing that discussions and changes will take time to implement, we are working on an action plan to identify and acquire the titles under the current schemes or rather schemes that you know, do not fall under the MOU. And uh, what I find important is to contact the filmmakers as soon as the project is completed in order to pre better preserve the materials. Now, it becomes increasingly difficult to acquire the materials years or even months after the project is completed. Therefore, I think it'll be useful to contact the filmmakers as soon as possible with, and I think it would definitely be helpful with, you know, if other agencies or the relevant agencies can help facilitate uh, these uh, communica communication channels to help us uh, achieve our objectives better. And so I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, next up, uh, we have Joshua Harris, another Joshua. And let me introduce him. Is Joshua on the spotlight? 
There you go. Yep. So Joshua Harris serves as the head of media preservation of the university libraries at the University of Illinois, USA. Josh received degrees in archaeology and history from Miami University, Ohio in 1998 and has 20 years of experience working in the preservation and conservation of museum, archive and cultural heritage materials. He worked as an archaeologist for the Illinois State Museum and the University of Tennessee before joining the zoology department of the Smithsonian Institution as a preservation technician. And Joshua started working with audiovisual materials after joining the National Geographic Society Film and Television Archives in 2003, where he supervised collection management, preservation, and the use of film, audio, and video archival materials on diverse platforms. Since his appointment at the University of Illinois in 2011, Josh has developed and led the university's first formalized media and audiovisual preservation program. Joshua has been involved with Sipawa for over 15 years and currently serves his second term as treasurer on the Sipawa Executive Council. And the screen is yours, Joshua. Okay. Um, can you all see this? Uh, okay. Thank you, Joshua, yeah. <laughs> uh, from one Joshua to another. Um, xin chào, everybody. Uh, it's warm greetings uh, to everyone far and wide. Um, it's my pleasure to, to speak with you today. Um, I'd like to thank the Vietnam Film Institute, uh, especially Ms. Uh, Hong Mai for hosting uh, generously this year's Sipava's 25th anniversary conference. Um, it's wonderful that VFI has been able to host some uh, attendance live in Hanoi, uh, as well as all over uh, the region and the world. Um, so it's uh, uh, pretty amazing that we can do this. Um, and I'd like to you know, also thank my, the Sipava Executive Council and everyone for making this, uh, this possible. So, uh, a lot of hard work, um, and uh, thank you for the to the translators as well. I will uh, try to speak as slowly as possible. Um, and so, uh, with that, I'd like to um, introduce my my topic for today's presentation: uh, a case study in preservation project management, um, the WILL radio transcription discs. Um, this is a long-term project uh, that I will explain in, in, in some detail. And I'm gonna be talking uh, mostly about the uh, challenges and uh, some of the, the, the uh, outcomes uh, from this long-term uh, project um, from the uh, pres preservational uh, perspective. So um, let's dive into it. Um, give you a little bit of, uh, of history um, first on, on WILL radio and its importance um, to the development of community and uh, independent radio in the United States. Um, we see that uh, in uh, 1920 that uh, the first U.S. radio license was issued to a uh, corporation in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and that was for the sole reason of uh, selling uh, radio receivers. Um, not a, exactly a true radio station, but more of a one large. But only a few short years later, uh, WILL AM, known at the time as WRM, for We Reach Millions, uh, even though their signal barely made it from uh, across town, <laughs> uh, signed on uh, broadcasting from the Electrical Engineering Laboratory at the university. That's the picture on the left, um, which is 
uh, take was taken in 1923 at the then early uh, WRM radio station. Um, in 1925, uh, the UVI and four universities banded together to form the first association of college and university broadcast stations. So these were, were the first four, five um, university broadcasters and all centered in the Midwest of the United States. So not in, a, in New York or uh, Los Angeles or where you would on the coasts, but in the middle of nowhere out in the, uh, in the, in the uh, farm, across the farms of the US. Um, interestingly, and this is a little bit of a side note, but um, as the development of these early sound uh, and audio visual technologies were being born, um, a fellow by the name of Joseph Tikochiner, uh, who I've done a, a decent amount of work on, as you can see, uh, some of you know uh, our friends at Sceneric, uh, doing we were doing a restoration project on early sound on film um, materials. Uh, he used to borrow the vacuum tubes um, that were used by WILL radio station, and he would sneak in at night and, and take the vacuum tubes so that he could work on his sound on film uh, experiments. Um, so you see uh, just a, is a very kind of a, a, the wild west of, of technology uh, development back then. Um, I'm not gonna go very much more in depth on history, uh, but it should be, um, it's Im important to note the, what the importance of, of WILL radio is. Um, in 1934, they were uh, the, the small consortium of five universities formed a bigger association, which was known as the National Association of Educational Broadcasters, formed at the University of Illinois. This would eventually form uh, into what is now National Public Radio, NPR, and the Public Broadcast Service, PBS, uh, which would begin in, those would begin in 1971. Um, so before that, it was, uh, these were, uh, consortium of university broadcasters who, again, were the developers of independent, non-commercial, um, radio, and then eventually in the, in, in television, uh, systems within the United States. And so they were putting out di a different kind of programming, um, and, and the preservation of that material is very, very important. Um, on the heels of that, WILL in 1941 would receive the first US FM license given to a university. And with that would begin a substantial growth that eventually formed uh, that the Association of Broadcasters would begin a true network of distribution, which they called a bicycle network at the time, um, which was based in the basement of one of the university halls, uh, which was their temporary headquarters, which they stayed in from 1949 till 1998. And you can see here the picture on the right, um, which is from 1943, of is a fellow in the basement of recording studio. Um, and in front of him are the uh, turntables and recording and four uh, universities lathes that which they stayed in from 1939 about, uh, until 1998 during this presentation. And behind him, back in the corner, you can see piles and piles of recordings stacked nicely in their shell on their shelves. The um, this would be an important point: the the bicycle network in that the university became a large producer of content and distribution of radio broadcast programs to smaller stations. Um, and this leads us directly into the collection side of things. And so this is where enter, enters what we call the lacquer transcription disc. 
known by many other names, such as the instantaneous acetate direct cut or electrical transcription disc. These were primarily used between the late 1920s, which was the dawn of this electrical recording um, technology through the early 1960s, although some, including WLL, would use it into the 70s. These were placed on a cutting lathe and recorded live audio. They were used to record live events. And as I've mentioned, they pre-recorded and distributed, distributed recordings to radio stations. They were used in dictation and field recordings and uh, were even beginning the early forms of home recording. Um, in fact, uh, Pepsi Cola you would send them over to, tr to American troops in uh, World War II and troops would send messages home recorded on the, using these instantaneous discs. Um, these, are, these are grooved discs that are rather large. The most common and most of what we saw are 16 inches in diameter. Um, and they're made up of a cellulose nitrate or acetate cellulose lacquer, which is thinly coated on a core, which is made of aluminum, uh, steel, um, glass. During, the, during war times, there was uh, metal was used by the uh, government um, for wartime uses. And uh, they were things were then put on glass bases. And some of the even the cheaper, cheapest versions were put on cardboard. Um, so this is a type of lacquer. Uh, I know uh, natural forming lacquer is often used as many of you are well aware in, in the some of the fine arts and, and historic artworks of, of uh, Southeast Asia and, and uh, China and East Asia. Um, this was a little bit of a different type of lacquer um, but still was a very soft material that could easily be cut into um, using a cutting lathe. So next down the realm is the transcription discs that were made by WILL or the ones that survive anyways. Um, at the time I started uh, playing with these discs, um, as you see here. Uh, there were approximately 3,000 of them, um, give or take a few hundred. Nobody really knew for sure. Um, there was no item level inventory uh, that existed. Um, only a box, only boxes uh, with a number on them. Um, they were stored in a basement with uh, very poor little to no climate control. Uh, They're packed into tightly into boxes, which had uh, original paper sleeves. The boxes were too heavy to even be lifted. These things are massively heavy. Um, many were already broken and damaged. And overall, the, the discs were in, were in terrible condition. So what can, what can go wrong with these, uh, these transcription discs? The number one thing we see, and it should be noted in terms of preservation um, the priorities for formats, uh, these transcription, lacquer transcription discs or radio discs should be high, high up on the level, high up on the ladder for preservation and digitization work. Um, and you'll see why soon. Um, the first thing that they suffer from is what is known as palmitic acid degradation. Um, this is caused by fatty acids in the lacquer. Uh, that have migrated to the disc surface as plasti plasticizers uh, in them begin to deteriorate. 
Um, as with many things, most things, actually just about everything, media related and cultural heritage collection related, poor storage and high temperature and relative humidity is what makes this happen. Um, in the early stages, it can look like a fine white dust, but as the plasticizer ex ex exudiates, uh, the laminate becomes shrink and shrunk shrinks and becomes more brittle, much like acetate film. Um, and it's later identifiable as a white greasy powder with a crystalline appearance, as you see in these pictures. It's often mistaken for mold because it's white. Delamination is a big problem uh, because the lacquer was so thinly coated. You can see these glass, these are glass core discs. Um, they're unpredictable uh, and they cause sudden catastrophic failure, um, again, caused by storage conditions. Um, the, these obviously, as seen in these pictures, are, this is irretrievable, um, the one on the far right. Uh, while there are technologies now that do help, uh, they are extremely expensive and you need to be very sure that the, the discs that you have require that five-star treatment. Many of these did not, or we didn't have any evidence to suggest that they were worth that. They're very fragile. Um, the discs are thin and they were often cheap using inferior quality materials. And they were not built for long-term preservation. The fact that we even had them was quite remarkable. And the stories from the archivists of how they were saved is a whole nother presentation altogether. Um, but proper handling is very important. You can see all of these cracked, broken. Um, the one down on the left has the core has just popped out. So it's been very, it was very difficult to play that one. We had to come up with a, a solution for that. Um, and the one on the right was a, a good, intending, good intending graduate student who just picked that up and it just shattered in his hands. Um, and, uh, and I've broken them, they, they break very, very easily. And so they have to be carry, handled with the utmost care. Um, all the other, all of these things combined with all of the usual stuff, uh, mold, dust and dirt, scratches just from playback and ha poor handling, warping, groove wear from being played a lot. Um, the disc on the, these, both these discs suffer from just about all of those things, including palmitic acid and delamination. And of course, all this certainly diminishes the playback sound quality. So, what did we want to do with these? Well, there obviously we were going to preserve them as the preservation department. That's our that's our goal. Um, so we developed, although we didn't really develop. I stepped into this project when I started in 2011. It had already begun, um, which I'll get to. But there was a, it was a lengthy multi-step process involving multiple people from all around the library system. Um, and really we just had two goals. There were two goals. One was to physically preserve the items themselves. Uh, our library and is committed to retaining the physical, retain physical media. So as the pres media preservation department, we do as much physical, we still do a decent amount of physical uh, of conservation work, mostly with film. Um, the other types of video and magnetic tape formats um, obviously are, are shorter lifespan on the physical object, but we are still keeping them for now, um, as, as even if they're digitized, which is not much. Um, and then digital transfer. We had to start doing this outside, outsourced with a vendor uh, because we didn't have, when I started, we did not have any in, internal facilities. And you can see here we had the vendor came, would come and pick them up in his car from about five hours away. And because they were stored so poorly, we had to develop this, this system, this, these packing sleeves, which were 
a uh, material called coroplast, which is heavily used in museum and, and archival situations. And we would tape them, put them in these sleeves, put bubble wrap in between each and uh, in between each disc. And so, uh, so that they would travel safely. Oops. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, we started having to do in-house conservation work um, on the disc, which it required intensive cleaning. Um, we developed a several stage cleaning process, uh, which for the most part was not very complicated. Um, it involves rough cleaning with warm water and dish detergent uh, and, and uh, cleaning the grooves with a toothbrush. As you see, my graduate assistant, assistant at the time, Miyuki, was, spent many hours cleaning with the toothbrush and drying them. Um, even got my son involved, as many of some of you have met him. Uh, he has no trouble getting, you know, it's not, this was, it was not uh, hugely um, difficult, just very, very time consuming. But we have ones that were very difficult and would get, uh, would need to be intensively cleaned. We, and we developed some chemical solutions, mostly using ammonia and some other uh, types of solutions for discs that were really, really bad. Um, we were designed special boxes for their long-term preservation, um, including uh, special sleeves that were uh, made, you know, from a, a um, archival company, but we would also pack that, make them pack with these spacers so that they would, because of our storage situation, many, we have, there's many different storage uh, um, vaults and at like many places. And so these were going to have to be handled and moved. Um, and so we made them so that they would be at least able to move uh, safely. Um, this is one of my, one of my favorite pictures. And this is, this is the before and after of the clean of the cleaning process. Um, you can see on the left uh, the grooves, um, top and bottom, with uh, ones zoomed in much more than the other. But these are the ones that are just coated with palmitic acid. You can see the the, the chunks in there. And then after a couple uh, rounds of cleaning, the images on the right. Um, the, the white lines that you see at the top are the reflection of the light. So that's the top of the groove, actually the peak. Um, and down in the middle, uh, those dark areas are the groove where, the, um, where your needle runs. So big, big difference. You cannot play them in this, on the left side. Those are unplayable. Um, and then we... Uh, did the in-house, then we started doing in-house digitization. This came, you know, a significant amount of time later uh, down the road, which I'll talk about why the, the kind of timeline and the challenges uh, to this project. But we did start doing digitization in-house, um, which required some, some changes in what we had or, and some modifications. Um, and, and it would, took a lot of uh, patience. Um, these discs were not are not easy to. Um, there's uh, many different ways they could be played. That's the um, the left top hand corner. Those are uh, six different sized um, needles for playback, and you have to experiment with the correct size and width, uh, as well as well as many other adjustments that have to be made during uh, the transfer process. And they're quite noisy. If anybody knows how to read a spectral uh, image of an audio. You can see at the bottom there's a lot of noise going on. So what were what were the challenges? And there's a lot of words here, but there were a lot of challenges here. This project took over ten years, uh, mainly because it was started it was started before we had a media preservation program. I joined in 2011. There had never been anybody to oversee um, to oversee this type of work. Uh, and it was started before by others before me. There were very, very little to go on. They, they had done about a couple hundred discs, enough to make a dent, enough to make cause problems. <laughs> there were no notes. They had already established a relationship with a vendor um, that that um, may or may not have been chosen. You know, it had been otherwise. 
Um, there was no statement of work. There was no technical specifications. Um, and for the first seven years, of six years that I worked there, we had no digital infrastructure uh, that was built for proper media storage and media and then and proper digital preservation activities. Um, there were thousands of files and multiple storage servers and external hard drives. Um, this workflow occurred across 27 different batches uh, that each one of these was, you know, either in-house or outsourced, um, sometimes with long gaps between the batches. And it was a metadata nightmare, as you can imagine. Um, because of limited personnel, including just myself and a graduate assistant, and one 50% employee after 2017, this constant change in personnel, both within our department and throughout the archives and the library, causes a lot of different hands in the pot. And um, it became very difficult to control. Uh, we had boxes picked up, scheduling was difficult, and we figured out that it would take about one and a half hours of labor for every 10 to 15 minutes of recorded sound because of the, 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 how bad, what bad shape they were in. And then between 2016 and 2017, uh, well, the project had started with limited financial resources. So no dedicated funding. I had to use money from my own general media budget, which was pulled in many, many different directions. And so there would be huge gaps in between when we would be able to work on this project. And the state of Illinois underwent a financial crisis in 2016, 2017, um, in which we pretty much did no work, <laughs> no, pre no outsourced preservation of any sort for 793 days. So that the unpredictability and instability makes a big undertaking, a big project like this with lots of moving parts, very difficult to sustain if that funding isn't available and, and right in the beginning. But we made it through all this and we learned a lot of lessons about how to, how to manage a big project with lots of moving parts. And in the end, we had transferred 3,184 disks uh, with metadata, over 18,000 digital files created. Um, and all those disks were clean, the ones that didn't break <laughs> were cleaned, re-sleeved and rehoused uh, in 127 archival boxes. And now a lot of them are available online as you can see, there's, but there's still a, a, there's still very little descriptive information about each recording. So it's very difficult to find them. But as we always say, once things are in digital form, all that stuff can come later. Getting the important part is to get it into digital form and off its carriers. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much. Come on, Bon. And Take care. Thank you, Joshua. Wow, what a uh, long process. Uh, <laughs> um, next, we have three presenters and they will take turns to present. It will be a pre-recorded presentation. Um, so bear with me as I introduce uh, all of them one by one right now. Uh, first, we have Ira Buonrestro. Um, she is an associate professor at the School of Library and Information Studies, UPSLIS, University of the Philippines, Diliman, where she teaches LIS and archival studies courses, both in the undergraduate and graduate levels. She finished her PhD in information studies in 2019 from Wee Kim Wee School of Communication and Information at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And she has been and is currently involved in projects related to education and training of LIS educators, librarians, archivists, and records managers. Establishment and management of record centers and archives and preservation of historical records. Her research interests include the development of archival theory and practice, the politics of libraries and archives, and their role in the formation of collective memory the use, contextualization, and preservation of archives such as photographic records and Filipiniana historical sources, and qualitative research methods in LIS. 
Ira is also the current editor-in-chief of the Philippine Journal of Librarianship and Information Studies, the first and longest-running academic journal in LIS in the Philippines. And the second presenter is Michelle Deloria. Um, she obtained her bachelor's degree in sociology in 2001 and master's degree in library and information science with specialization in archival studies at the UP School of Library and Information Studies, UPSLIS, in 2019 from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. And she is a member of the Society of Filipino Archivists, SFA, and is currently an administrative staff at the University Library Archives Division. And the third presenter is Rosemary Roque. She is an assistant professor at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, PUP, and a research chief of its Center on Labor and Industrial Relations Studies, CLIRS. L Rose Roque represents the Society of Filipino Archivists for Film, SOFIA, in the National Committee on Archives, NCA, of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, NCCA. There's a lot of alphabet soup right here. And currently serves as NCA National Secretary. Rosemary Roque is an assistant professor. Oh, I have done that. <laughs> and she is presently the project manager of NCCA BOP, Philippine Documentary Heritage, archival collection on the COVID-19 pandemic, a digital repository building initiative. And Rose is also an in associate individual member of the Southeast Asia Pacific Sipava since April 2017. She is also an individual member of the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives, IASA, since January 2019, and an individual member of AMIR, Association of Moving Image Archivists, just this April of 2021. So without further ado, let's hear what they have to say. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ira Van Rosso Kabab, and I am here with my co-presenters, Michelle Deloria and Rosemary Roque. And thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you our presentation entitled Acts of Volunteerism in the Preservation of Archives. In the previous IPAVA conferences in Manila and Bangkok in 2017 and 2018, we discussed our ongoing projects resulting from our shared initiative and advocacy of capturing and preserving important pieces of evidence of Philippine history. We revisited the provenance of AV archives relating to the martial law era in the Philippines in the 1970s to 1980s, as well as other activities and community engagements that lead to the discovery of these important archival materials, including the ones kept by various agencies in the Philippines and individual collections. Continuing these initiatives is not an easy task, but we are lucky to have volunteers that are willing to share their time, efforts, and expertise in the literature and praxis of archival science, volunteerism in the archives, and similar information and cultural institutions is a common and valuable phenomenon. People volunteer for a variety of reasons. There are also different perceptions towards the concept of volunteerism itself. Some view the volunteers as saviors of community who make things happen as tools to build connections and relationships with people and ideals. As a venue where people can gain experience and find their work and calling, and also as something that promotes good health, both physical and mental health. Since there are a lot of benefits that we can obtain from having volunteers to work in various projects, in managing our volunteers, it is important to have a framework or a mindset on how to engage them while sustaining culture and history through the initiative that we are doing. As we try to make our cultural and historical projects successful, we should also be mindful of the mutual benefits that we and the volunteers would be getting from this experience. In the next couple of minutes, we will, you will be hearing from Michelle and Rose the different phases and features of volunteering in Capstone Project and advocacy and research work in the archives. Thank you, Ms. Ira. During my graduate studies, we were challenged to create groundbreaking research outputs. However, I decided to do a research project 
that has a direct impact and a practical solution to a stakeholder. Thus, the processing of the Burgess family. In the next five slides, I will be giving a brief background about the Burgess collection, the processes done, the people involved, the cost, issues, and problems encountered, and results emanating from the project. Poseji Burgess Jr. was the editor and publisher of the We for the Young Filipino, or is commonly known today as the We Forum, or simply We. It was founded on May 1, 1977. These and other newspapers during martial law was considered as an alternative press. It is important to know that the We Forum released a series of articles regarding the fake World War II medals and false claims of President Marcos. This irritated the president and coined the Mosquito Press. The Mosquito Press refers to the anti-dictatorship newspapers during the martial law era. I was able to process 4,402 and unpublished photographs dating from 1984 to 1995, including undated photographs. Most of these photographs were published in their newspapers, while some were published in other newspapers, which the Burgess family did not own. The photographers originally owned the photographs that were used in other publications, but were submitted to the Burgess family. Some photographs were not labeled, so the Burgess family could not ascertain the provenance of the photos. A total of 117 hours and 30 minutes was rendered in the preservation, conservation, processing of the photographs from March to December 2018. And another 72 hours was rendered in the intellectual and physical organization of the process photographs from December 2018 to March 2019. Three volunteers, two librarians and one faculty member were given instructions on how to handle the photographs. They understood the value of the photographs and its impact upon its completion. From the experiences of the volunteers, there arose some constraints in handling the photographs, which deals with its sensitivity content and confidentiality. That is why I did not hire any staff. Although the work hours and load may be lessened if there were some trained people to do the work. Time, health, and financial constraints were some of the challenges that we faced. The total cost of the project based on the average exchange rate in 2018-2019 is 52 Philippine peso per one US dollar. So it is more or less 1,173 US dollars. More than half of the cost was spent to the archivist and the remaining amount was spent to the operating cost. In January 2020, Mr. Jonathan Isip, a faculty member of the School of Library and Information Studies at the University of the Philippines, offered Mrs. Burgess to digitize half of the processed photographs. Mrs. Burgess agreed and had a small talk in his digital preservation class in March 2020. But the community quarantine status in the Philippines was a major factor that halted this endeavor. However, not all stories are the same. Let's hear the experiences of the advocacy projects of Ms. Roque in her presentation. Thank you, Ira and Michelle. So now let's talk about advocacy as research and volunteer work. I will focus on the Asia Visions Audiovisual Collection Community Archiving Project and spin-offs. Mainly, I will discuss its brief background, projects, activities done with the volunteers, issues and problems, and how the volunteers overcame it, and other activities that had resulted from this initiative. Established in 1982, Asia Visions was an independent media collective that documented the realities, atrocities, protests, and political movements during martial law in the Philippines. AV AVMF produced newsreels and documentaries, which, which served as tools for awareness raising against the propaganda materials that was being disseminated by the established 
establishment press of the Marcos dictatorship. Upon its dissolution in 1999, the Asia Visions collection was transferred to Ibon Foundation, a development organization. The collection, primarily composed of magnetic videotapes, including master copies of the films produced by Asia Visions, and more importantly, associated raw footage covering the Philippines in the 1980s. Given the absolute broadcast media control of the Marcos dictatorship until the middle of 1980s, materials and footage such as these are rare and very difficult to come by. The EV collection of Asia Visions is the first beneficiary of the Community Archiving Workshop Manila. The Cow Manila is, uh, is initiated to assist Ibon Foundation in jumpstarting the preservation of Asia Visions collection. It echoes the similar initiatives of the Moving Image Archiving Preservation Program of New York University and that of the Association of Mo Moving Image Archivists, duly formalized as the Community Archiving Workshop model. So the pilot series of volunteer works was handled by faculty and student volunteers from the University of the Philippines School of Library and Information Studies together with Ibon Foundation and its network of volunteers. It is continued today by individual advocates, collaborators, and volunteers. So in March 2017, a memorandum of agreement was uh, made and Cow Manila is expected to help Ibon with the following, the collection assessment report, the duly process collection, a database of process collection, mainly covering 874 magnetic umatic tapes and training and briefing of partner organization. So the volunteer project started, as I've said, in 2017. So from the first quarter, January to March, planning meetings between organizers and, um, and coordination with Ibon Foundation happened. So in, on April 1, 2017, the first Cal Manila was held coinciding with the 21st Sepava Conference. And during this workshop, there were about 150 umatic tapes processed. And since the next uh, month of May 2017 until September of 2018, uh, Free the Tapes Community Archiving Project workshops were opened to the public to process the tapes. So one of the observations related to the archiving volunteer project was the non-standardized performance and output, particularly related to the encoding of unique ID numbers on casing versus the unique ID number on tape. So other problems encountered or delays and setbacks was given the volunteers were working with obsolete media um, no longer in the market or industry, securing the necessary equipment and services have been quite challenging. A potential key partner for initial digitization project when an initial funding was secured um, needed to outsource materials from overseas while there were delay setbacks in preparing equipment locally available. There were crucial factors that push the timeline or change the plans accordingly. So while funding was continuously sourced out, um, available low-end digital copies of keywords were processed for public as access using simple solutions. The rendering of digital, digital copies using existing aspect ratios, improving audio quality via open source software, and including transcription and or translation as sub subtitle. Such low cost, good enough, do it yourself solutions made public screenings possible. So that was why on September 2018, the Daluyong political filmmaking in a period of social unrest, a screening with the UP Film Institute, UP Archons, the student archiving organization, 
with Ebon Foundation was held. The film screening um, happened in the UP Videotech showcasing the select Asia Visions AV collection uh, films and other political films. So you can see from the images, we continued with the public screenings and engagements in the Another one was held in September 2018 at the University Library of UP. And in December uh, 2018, during the Artists for Human Rights, film screenings were held. And one of them was uh, The Arrogance of Power, the film by Asia Visions. By 2019, the same films by Asia Visions were screened in February 2019 in New York, in September 2019 in La Union. It's one of the provinces north of Luzon in the Philippines. And in August um, to December 2019, small-scale digitization of select tapes or titles were uh, made possible from various sources such as out-of-pocket funds uh, or costs shouldered by groups or institutions interested with the select collection titles. So in 2020, even though there was, uh, or we, we are in the middle of a pandemic, um, we were able to screen um, Asia Vision titles like in, in Spain during um, the August 2020 screening in San Sebastian in, in, in a school there, in a film school. So, so the continuous advocacy for public engagement and access continued from September um, in the Philippines. Screenings were done online via the Activista Human Rights Film Festival. The, the Ang Documentary, a festival of Philippine documentaries, also featured Asia Visions uh, films that was, uh, that, that's part of the collection that the Community Archiving Workshop um, serviced. So thank you for listening. Back to you, Ira. Thanks, Rose, and also thanks, Michelle. So we have already seen and heard the different experiences of Michelle and Rose in running projects with volunteers. Based on these experiences, we have learned vital points that will serve as our guide in the next steps that we will undertake in sustaining projects such as the ones mentioned earlier. First is the importance of getting support from various people and communities. This is challenging yet fulfilling because we get to find and engage with people and organizations that have the same interests. In this way, we can influence one another and spark other people's interests for them to be more aware and possibly be involved in these preservation activities. Another point which is equally important is the management of project with volunteers. It is necessary to know how to keep the communication lines open with the collaborators as well as the volunteers. Complete documentation is also necessary as well as contingency plans for the project's continuity, including grant proposal writing. It is indeed a balancing act between making the project successful and being mindful of our volunteers' welfare. While volunteers give their time and most of the time free labor, we need to ensure that when funding is available, funds should also be allotted to them, such as incentives, and most importantly, they should be given recognition for their efforts. We can then tap and negotiate with more collaborators and even more volunteers who share the same interests or who are interested to gain experiences in a particular area. And in dealing with volunteers, we should fully understand that there are advantages and disadvantages just like in any project. While getting volunteers can jumpstart an almost impossible project or activity, we need to make sure that we're essentially imparting and sharing knowledge and experiences with them. We should also be aware of the reality of this scheme. People come and go. There will always be problems with funds. There may always be issues in meeting deliverables and processes, as well as the assessment and outputs of the volunteers. 
Most importantly, there should be mutually beneficial experiences between you, the project manager, and the volunteers. There should also be a good relationship among the volunteers. For other projects that will need to have volunteers, it's important to have an established volunteer program with the following list of considerations. Number one, there should be ethical treatment of volunteers, which includes sensitivity to their well-being. Secondly, mutual agreement and properly managed expectations. Sustainability plan, not just for the project, but also to maintain the volunteers. Performance and evaluation metrics. And lastly, feedback mechanism in which the volunteers can express their thoughts, their feelings, and even their learnings from the projects. So with that, thanks so much for listening. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Ira, um, Rose, and Michelle. Well, right now we are in the questions and answers section. Shall we get everyone to turn on their video? That's right. Um, all right, we've received quite a lot of questions um, in the Q&A box over here. Um, there's one quick one for Matthew. Uh, what, uh, this is from Hanoi uh, on site. Uh, what's the current percentage of non-Singaporean films in your collection? So, um, since we are located, located in Singapore, uh, I'll say the majority of the works are Singaporean. But with regards to non-Singaporean uh, titles, I would say it's uh, between 35 to 40%. Cool. Um... Before we jump into any uh, some of these questions who are quite detailed uh, to individual presenters, I would like to ask all of you to talk a little bit about um, the collaboration tools. Um, say um, for Ira, Rose and Michelle, you talk about collaboration with volunteers and running uh, uh, workshops. Um, any particular nuggets to share? And for, for Joshua, you... Any any particular tools or, or uh, idea or something that jump, jumped out uh, when you were trying to wrangle and manage the so many um, different stages of the process? And for Matthew, um, yeah, just just anything, one thing uh, that, that jumps out of your mind when, um, when you are collaborating with um, the different agencies that uh, with your MOU and things like that. Maybe we start with uh, okay. Ira, Rose, or Michelle, either of you. <laughs> hey, hi. hi, everyone. Good to see you again. <laughs> um, yeah, so as regards um, collaboration tools, um, actually, we're just using what we currently have. So we're actually taking advantage of the social media platforms and even the, me you know, the, the usual messaging apps like, you know, Facebook Messenger, uh, Messenger, and even WhatsApp, and Gmail, and Google Drive. So those are the available tools that we use for communicating with our volunteers and even how we communicate with each other, like with Michelle and with Rose, and with the potential collaborators or even um, those who would like to volunteer for the projects. Um, although, for example, in our workplace with me and my, with my, and with my colleagues in the faculty, we uh, were actually trying to, to use different platforms like Slack or Trello, uh, you know, for, 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 uh, for proper monitoring of our work. But sometimes it doesn't work <laughs> because um, we, we just use what's freely available or what's, uh, you know, what we think is more comfortable to, to be used like Facebook or even Facebook Messenger, even WhatsApp or Viber. So the, the key here is, I guess, um, to, to find out the tools that your, your stakeholders are more comfortable using rather than really... Um, imposing to them that guys who should really be using this because this is the you know the more modern one or the, the in thing but we should be more um, I think more sensitive about these things because not everyone has may have the capability to 
to use the the tools that we want them to use. Indeed, indeed. Uh, sure. How about yes, Rose? Yes. Just, uh, quickly add. Actually, since I deal with um, large files with uh, videos, like it was mentioned in the presentation that we had a screening in San Sebastian, Spain. Um, it was a good idea since uh, it's a digital copy. But the problem is the internet, uh, you know, the, the technology infrastructure of particularly the Philippines. <laughs> Even if I wanted higher resolution, you know, uh, a better copy, we just have to deal with it. And all other uh, projects that deals with video material transfer, um, there were times that we uh, had been delayed, though it is in another project, but that is the real situation. But of course, not just affecting our project, but everyone in the Philippines. So we really wish we had the same technology in Singapore. I mean, the setup, like when we, I went there in the airport, I didn't leave the place because I don't downloaded the <laughs> files that I needed to download before that I wasn't able to download before in the Philippines, that kind of, you know, problem. Yeah. Yeah. And as for me, as for all of us, it's beyond the technology, the tools, the softwares, the applications. Um, we must uh, be concerned with our volunteers, our uh, sensitivity, our um, communication line should always be open. The emotional quotient of, uh, especially today, where the men where mental health is a, a particular concern. Indeed, indeed, especially in these troubled times. How about you, Joshua? So, um, yeah, that's a that's a great question, especially from a, a really pro you know preservation project management. Um, first off, that one of the main issues, uh, especially in the use of tools is is again having a lot of different uh, um, places that are operating in their own way and that's common of large institutions all over the place but even with the, if, even with our own small department the the constant turnover of student grad student staff coming and going so perfect example would be, you know, I want to pull the box from storage. I have to put a ticket in some system. They communicate with me on some system. I'm communicating with the vendor using Jira or some, you know, uh, and then the IT guy, IT people want to use some system. Then a student comes and they say, well, I'm using Trello. This is great. You don't have to worry about this anymore. In the background, I have about 15 Excel spreadsheets trying to gather all of this information in, in some way. And then somebody says, oh, it's on Google Drive. The other one puts it in Dropbox. The other one puts it in Box. The other one puts it on OneDrop. You know, I mean, it, there's yep. trying to, uh, uh, and, and I think another portion of this is being within a university setting where there is, uh, how should I put this? Nobody wants to make a decision <laughs> and say, <laughs> everybody uses this because we all have to have our own ideas and about how to, you know, and stuff, which is good in many regards, but also uh, it, it, it makes, um, it makes management, project management very difficult. So uh, too many tools in the toolbox at the moment. But the Excel spreadsheet Hello guys, is this always is Emmanuel there from... for me. No? <laughs> okay. Spreadsheet. How about you, Matthew? So in terms of uh, collaboration between the agencies, I would say we do not collaborate in a technical manner, but more on programming. And so we build on each other's effort in terms of promoting Singapore film. And within the three agencies, um, we have our own film programs and we support one another through uh, providing the content. I like say the films from the archive and we build on each other's effort through social media platforms. Mm. All right. Okay, so here are some specific questions for Matthew, actually. Um, is the dip 
deposit of the funded films to AFA mandatory? If yes, has any producer not deposit their funded film and how does AFA deals with it? Tricky one. So the short answer is yes, it is mandatory as long they receive public money. And this is um, stated right in the funding agreement right from the start where um, the filmmaker is, is made known to deposit a film at the end of the production. And how we ensure this is uh, the funding or rather the production grant is broken into multiple parts. Uh, and um, the final milestone of this uh, grant is um, only given when the film is deposited at the archive. And once the film is deposited and we acknowledge and verify that, then the commission releases that final milestone to the filmmaker. Therefore, if they do not do the, the last deliverable, they will not get their money. That's the strong incentive <laughs> right there. Um, another question from Mavis. Uh, the, the previous question was also from um, this person. Um, for films outside of AFA MOU, while preservation is priority, does access comes under part of the deal for deposit at AFA? What if filmmaker indicated no access? Does AFA has a procedure to say uh, that the access will be reviewed in five years or 20 years? And so when the filmmaker receives the grant, it is made very clear that the film will be will have to be made. Oh, sorry, we have to will have to be archived. And part of this archiving process is to make the film available for access. And there has been instances where, you know, say the film has just gotten a theatrical release. And I think uh, that's where exceptions can be made for maybe one or two years and and all this is quite informal, but um, so far we haven't um, experienced any issues in terms of uh, creating access for the films that come through this um, channel. Mm. Um, this is another question from Hanoi. I would like to adapt the question a little bit. It, the question is about what is the policy of AFA with regards to the acquisition of films not produced with public funding? Uh, like, for example, works from independent filmmakers. Um, is there a selection policy that you publish that uh, we can all see? Uh, yes, uh, the selection and um, acquisition policy is actually on our website. And uh, this is a very tricky one. And I think the, the challenge is the scope of uh, the work, you know, being an Asian archive, you know, um, we go beyond Singapore. And, um, and like you say, um, without... Uh, formal channel for for films to come in it's it's really up to us to to um, make the assessment internally on uh, titles that we deem uh, um, culturally significant uh, historically significant so um, there are many things to consider and, and there's really no simple answer to this and um, yeah it, it it's it comes through many modes, you know, suggestions, uh, looking at film festivals. So it, it's a lot of, we, we consider many things in terms of outside of our films that are getting public funding. Cool. So next up, we have a question specifically for Joshua. You mentioned there are a lot of broken discs and uh, are, they, are any of them restored? And can you do anything about playing back some of them or retrieving the content from broken or chipped discs? So uh, yeah, that's a, a very good question. And it, it, there's many factors. One, of course, is how just how damaged it is. Um, if there's only a few little chips off it in various places, you can, you can play it. You just have to be, do a lot of manual movements. So you can play up to where it's chipped and then you can start it again. And you have to, you have to really handle it like, slowly and deliberately mm -hmm. uh there's we have tools in the digital side now that can can be used to compensate for some of the, the hand hold, hand work that you have to do um in terms of speed and and such um 
anything that is beyond that, like the pictures I showed you, those were mostly extreme examples, obviously, although a lot of them were, the, the palmitic acid wasn't, but the, 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 you have to really look at the content that's on there. Um, the, and the funds you have to do what, that level of work, which is very detailed and does is still not a guarantee that you're going to get uh, sound off of that. Um, it's putting the pieces back together and then reading it with a la uh, laser driven apparatus, um, which is out of the reach of just about 99% of people who work in this world um, globally. <laughs> uh, the but our solution to this is that while we don't know what to, that's why we are very committed to as much preservation of the physical object as possible. So we would keep the chips in a little, we put them in a small bag, tie them up, put them in the, with, with the, within the sleeve. Um, we would, any glass pieces, any pieces that fell off, we kept them. Uh, so that while that technology might be not, possible now in the future it might be very easy we don't we don't know um so we've done our best with what we were given and then we uh leave it on for the next uh generations to to uh, get to if they if they decide that's something they want to do <laughs> so we didn't do anything with we didn't do any that being said we did we did not do anything to that level with any of the discs. Okay. Thank you, Joshua. Okay, now we have some sure. questions. The questions are flying in. I was like, where did they come from? <laughs> um, uh, there are some questions from the uh, Community Archiving Project. Um, uh, this is from Lays. Uh, do volunteers sign some sort of contract so that things that they archive are kept confidential? Um, with the pandemic, happening now do volunteers get to uh, continue to do anything maybe remotely or something like that um, i will answer this um respect to with respect to the contract it, the contract uh, is signed between up slis and the uh, ebon foundation i was the liaison so i uh, I know that that's the only contract um, signed, and but the point is, um, we already chose what materials can be, you know, um, entrusted. We we were not able to to process everything. If there were around one thousand three hundred plus uh, magnetic tapes in the collection, and eight hundred seventy four were pulled out at the time. So those were more or less already chosen that can be, you know, we know that can be entrusted to, to be publicly known in a way. <laughs> so that's it, I guess. So the trust of uh, finding um, the, the right uh, volunteers with that in mind, but they have the orientation. I know the Bono, uh, oriented the students who were involved they fight they organized UP Arkans a student um, organization uh, born out of the, the context and um, yeah that those commitment it was uh, not in a contract but we're all aware of this the uh, maybe it's a part of the trusting <laughs> I know we could have maybe done more but it's all so about far trust. it it was how it started, and I cannot make up for something that we didn't ask them to to sign. So maybe I, I reckon, yeah, add to the since I'll just add something to that. Um, yeah, thanks, Rose. Yes. Um, because uh, of course, UPS Elias is running um, several expansion projects. So outside of our academic offerings and stuff going on in the school, so we. We try to reach out to, to more groups and communities. So one of the things that we're doing as an academic institution is that we're encouraging our graduate students to dedicate their time, just like Michelle, as her capstone project to help organizations. So part of the requirement 
uh, just like what Michelle did, is that before they would um, pursue um, a project, a volunteer project is like this, um, there should be an informed consent form to be um, secured with the stakeholders and the organization that the student is, is helping. So there should also be a non-disclosure agreement between the, the project manager, in, the, in, in Michelle's case, she's the project manager, and of course, um, with, the, with the volunteers that she's hiring. So uh, as part of that requirement of, her, uh, of the capstone project, um, there is a complete set of documentation involved. So in Rose's um, Rose, um, case, so that's another project um, being done by SLIS in collaboration with other organizations. So I think the answer is it's case-to-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. So since we're doing um, something um, like that, so it's, it's a different case. So for Michelle, so there is really a complete documentation um, needed before she carries out or before the student carries out a project. So I think there's another question here. That's right. Okay. With yeah. The training. Happen With yeah. the pandemic yeah. happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can speak for the for this. I think I can just speak for the capstone projects being done by the school. Yes, we do. I think I discussed this yesterday in my uh, presentation regarding uh, archival education. Uh, mm -hmm. We're encouraging our students to. Um, to continue doing their, their projects even with this pandemic via online means. So one of the projects done by one of my graduate students is that we did this community archiving workshop with this um, community in the mountain province. It's 300 kilometers away from Manila. So ideally, the original plan was we would go there. So I would accompany probably accompany the student to conduct the community training there. But due to the pandemic, obviously, we couldn't go there. And yeah, so we had to um, revise the entire training program so that it could be done online. So we just had to assess. Uh, it's like not a top to bottom approach. It's like bottom to top approach. So we had to assess the needs first of the community and the volunteers and the locals and then transformed the entire program into something that could be done online. So it still, um, it still continues. It's difficult, but we're still doing it. So if you want to support us, the UPS Alliance, we will be more than happy to receive um, support and help from our colleagues in the region if you'd like to help us with these kinds of trainings and programs. So thank you. Sounds, sounds exciting. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> come. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right. Um, okay, since we're at, uh, at this in uh, volunteer the, retention. Oh, you have something to add, Rose. Sorry. Go uh, ahead. Just the spin-offs in the, the presentation. I mentioned the spin-offs. So the question um, will be answered by that. What, do volunteers get to continue? Yes, because we have spin-offs and we evolved to the to handle um, the situation, I, 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 I guess, because we had a screening in San Sebastian, Spain, and it's really a fruitful engagement because we were able to get, until now we're under continuous in, you know, communication with them, correspondence. Um, I cannot tell the details now, but the point is it resulted to, to further uh, possible collaboration. So we are able to manage um, the work, but it's a spin-off already of the Cow Manila project. I see. I hope I'm okay. I think my internet is uh, having a problem, so I, I at least I at least I hope I get some points yep. across. Thank I you. Think so, um, uh, just just to continue on this, um, how do you retain your volunteers? Uh, uh, how do you deal with um, when there is low volunteer commitment or do you have low volunteer commitment? Uh, I think Michelle can answer that. Michelle? Right. So um, for the question, thank you. Uh, yes, we do have that uh, confidentiality agreement with a stakeholder, the owner, Mrs. Burgess, and the student volunteers of uh, Mr. Jonathan Isip, 
Uh, what we do is we have a communication line, and during the training, hands-on, um, we, we sit side-by-side side and do the training. And so how we retain, um, we support each other morally, uh, intellectually, and uh, socially. <laughs> is it that general? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you just um, keep going at them, like... Um keep them in constant communication yes and to spark their interest yes in my experience i may i claim that there is a need for a constant person i guess for a project that really takes a long while um, a constant volunteer is also uh, well necessary in my case i may consider that my to be myself and i i know that uh, people come and go it's voluntary. It's a given fact. Uh, we we should not take it against <laughs> people oh. of low moral because that's the nature of voluntary work. The fact that they gave an hour or a day, we already you know feel so 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 thankful and what we do is yeah maintain communication lines so even if they're no longer volunteer volunteering we need to communicate with them maybe an information that we need to you know um double check or update them and for one i may answer the how do we thank them so far when we have the spin-offs like we credit them if they did this the transcription the subtitling, we ask for their permission to be included and we share to them that, oh, we're, we have a screening. We, we always uh, make sure that they know what, uh, uh, what's happening. And I know Joshua is saying that he's very interested to know what's happening now because Joshua and to the rest of the Sepava volunteers in April 1, 2017, we are forever grateful you have given us that expertise and even if we're you know separated by by this condition it's never will be forgotten and that high morale that we 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 don't really you know delve on that low turnout well, well we need more so please <laughs> contact us but oh. we, we're just you know like dory we keep on swimming <laughs> well looking forward to more exciting things coming from uh from from you guys um we are running a little bit short of time we will have a last question it's a big question for matthew <laughs> yesterday one of the presenter mentioned that a large part of russia actually sits on the continent of asia um but there's little russian content in this um region um how does afa define what constitute asian film and uh and will it consider some of this for acquisition? Um, I guess this also uh, ties in with a collaboration theme that we have in this session. Like how um, would AFA consider collaborating with, uh, I don't know, Russian filmmakers? Well, thank you for the question. It's a very, very good one. I think first, um, I think there are many ways to constitute what Asian is or what Asianness is. But I think first and foremost, we are um, aware and also recognize that there are many other Asian film archives in the world. And I think key to that is we do not want to replicate or duplicate work. Therefore, we do not um, acquire um, any content just because it's Asian. So I think there are a lot of considerations when it comes to an acquisition. So I think that's first and foremost. So if you look at a piece of work and say, oh, maybe that is already uh, being cared for by another archive, then I think, I think that is, that's great, you know? And I think that's how we see ourselves um, collaborating with uh, um, internationally as well. But in terms of, uh, you know, what constitutes Asian, Asianness, I think there are many, many ways to look at it and, um, we don't just, just look at it geographically. It could be you know, Asian filmmaker. It could be a film about uh, Asian subjects. So there are many ways to look at it. And I think uh, we don't have a one-size-fits-all uh, policy. It really uh, depends on a case-by-case. -case and um, assessments uh, have to be discussed internally also. So I think you know, 
uh, we try to give ourselves uh, a little bit of flexibility when it comes to uh, making these uh, decisions. Cool. Uh, Sanchai, do we still have time? I have just received one very exciting comment. Can I ask this question? <laughs> um, basically, this is, this is a comment uh, from August uh, M. A. Andong. It says, volunteerism is really commendable, but I think for archiving, there should be a really a way to generate and come up with better budget in order to provide appropriate compensation in the future for a more permanent workers and to generate better jobs for archivists. Yeah, I guess Joshua, like, um, do, do you I, do you use any volunteers? And um, I know you are only one staff, but um, <laughs> uh, well, we one point five, yeah. I use a few volunteers sparingly. They have to be students who are who have shown a a true and genuine interest in audiovisual archiving and preservation and that i would that I, it's usually one uh something where i have where i say i want i want to do everything in my power to pay you <laughs> mm -hmm. and i will continue to search for any funding to pay you but if you are willing and you would like to learn some new this and you're really interested then you know that that would be awesome if you join us. Um, we don't let we don't um, we aren't allowed to use uh, volunteers from the outside. The regular it, that's just a preservation policy. Mm -hmm. The some of the more the archival uh, the archives and libraries uh, with the more uh, using the more traditional style um, do use volunteers um, and. Uh, but one thing I wanted to just real quick to touch on, um, whether you're using volunteers or paid staff, paid students, whatever, uh, and, and as myself, as someone who's training new uh, preservationists, um, it's, it's really important to, uh, and, and, and all the, the ladies uh, mentioned this um, in some form, to keep the, the morale up for these people, uh, for mm -hmm. anybody, uh, because, uh, you know, it has a, a very quick excitement level. And then you realize that you've looked at five tapes and there's 995 more to look at, or there's 3000 working with collections can be monotonous. It can have, and, and so, you know, we try to make it as fun as possible. We try to mix things up. We try to, you know, not be so, you know, we try to be pretty loose <laughs> when, when we can, you know, and, and, uh, but just to try to make it is make it have some fun in there, uh, is really important, uh, especially now, they, now more than ever, obviously, but, but, uh, uh, but so, yeah, it's, it's cool. challenging. Yeah, look, sounds like this is like a, another seminar by itself, like volunteer reserve and paying uh, archivists uh, the appropriate uh, uh, amount. And like, uh, maybe we should uh, suggest to Sipawa. <laughs> How do we get more funding? <laughs> um, anyway, thank you, everyone. I think we have really ran over the, this allotted time. And... Um, uh, see you see you in a while in uh, in 15 minutes in the conclusion session thank you